Welcome everybody. Um, I'm Sunil Amrith, uh, Chair of the South Asian Studies Council at Yale. I'm delighted to welcome you to the first in a new series of recorded conversations uh, with authors of recent books in the field of South Asian Studies. Um, this will take place alongside our usual live events, which, which this semester will happen on Zoom. Uh, if you'd like to see our seminar program, please do uh, check out the South Asian Studies Council's website. Um, I couldn't be more delighted to have as my first guest on this new series, uh, Dr. Prashant Kidambi. Uh, Prashant is Associate Professor of Colonial Urban History at the University of Leicester, and really one of the finest historians of Bombay. Uh, Prashant's first book, um, The Making of an Indian Metropolis, uh, really provided a whole new perspective on Bombay's urban history. And in that, and across a number of other writings, uh, he has uh, pioneered the study, the history of, of India's middle class, which is surprisingly understudied. He's written about housing and public health, about comparative urban and imperial history. Uh, we're here today, though, to talk about Prashant's uh, new book, which was published last year. It says, uh, Cricket Country, an Indian Odyssey in the Age of Empire. Um, Cricket Country was shortlisted for the Wolfson Prize in History in the UK, as well as being one of the Financial Times Sports Books of the Year. It found a very wide audience in South Asia as well. And I'm really, really delighted to have you with us, Prashant. Welcome. So I think um, Cricket Country begins with what is uh, almost a perfect opening sentence. You write, if the origins of English cricket were decidedly rural, the beginnings of Indian cricket were indubitably urban. And what a wonderful sentence that is. I think that really sets up the fact that in some ways, Bombay is itself a protagonist of the first part of this story. And I wondered, and particularly as a historian of Bombay, whether you could talk about how cricket first worked its way into the fabric of the city. Yes, um, I think in a way cricket country emerged out of my own long-standing interest in the history of Bombay. And one thing that always surprised me about um, uh, scholarly research on Bombay was that it tended to steer clear of sport and particularly the sport that dominates Bombay's public culture. Anybody who's been to Bombay knows that the most indelible uh, image that uh, you're likely to see is of hundreds of people gathered in the uh, open spaces of the city uh, playing uh, games of cricket. And often these games are going on side by side. Um, the implements can be ranged from the very sophisticated to the very rudimentary. But cricket dominates Bombay's public culture. And I was always very surprised that uh, this aspect had been uh, completely ignored. And I, I think it had to do with the fact that somehow for a long time, sport was not seen as a serious object of scholarly investigation. So people could write um, a lot about, you know, the Bombay's distinctive cosmopolitan culture, the, the, the way the public sphere evolved in Bombay, and not say a word about the one activity that often dominated many of the debates within that public sphere, and that is cricket. So uh, in a way, my interest in the history of Bombay uh, led me to uh, looking at cricket. Of course, I was interested in the sport itself and its history, but Bombay was a natural place to look, to carry out an investigation of this kind. And that is because uh, cricket takes root in Bombay in the mid 19th century, just as it is emerging um, as one of the most dynamic port cities in India uh, and, and in, in, in Asia. And Bombay's history and the history of, you know, the, the history of Bombay as a modern city and the history of cricket in Bombay uh, have these parallel uh, sort of uh, tracks, as it were. They kind of dovetail in very interesting ways. Um, and what is so interesting uh, when one looks at cricket in Bombay is that how it allows us to explore very key themes in the making of colonial public cultures. You know, the on the one hand, the uh, models that are taken from European context, but then completely remade, infused with new meanings, given a very distinctive identity, and this whole idea of same but not quite, you know, uh, and, and, and the anxieties that provokes, the, the ways in which communities of sociability are formed, uh, the ways in which all kinds of arguments about imperial citizenship, about race, about identity, about inclusion, about exclusion, all of these play themselves out through the sport. So for me, cricket was very integral to Bombay's identity, and it's a site in which I investigate some of these themes. And it's striking that in, in some ways, it, 
it became acceptable to uh, study other forms of popular culture before sport, perhaps, you know, people have been writing about cinema in Bombay for, for a much longer period of time than sort of the serious scholarly study of cricket. So I think that does say something interesting about, you know, how we conceive uh, historical scholarship. Um, just building on the point you just made about that sort of the fact that these things happen at the same time, the introduction of cricket and, and Bombay's rise as, as an important, uh, pivotal port city. You can test the received idea that it is in fact the sort of pre-modern features of cricket that made it attractive to India. In fact, you see cricket in the Indian incarnation as, as conspicuously modern. Um, and I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. Yes, uh, this is actually uh, one of the uh, lines of argument that cricket country develops uh, implicitly in cases, more explicitly in other places. Um, and, and to put this in perspective, I would need to say a bit about cricket in the English imagination. Yes. I mean, cricket, as you know, is for a long time bound up with notions of Englishness. Even today, you have books on English identity, which will have uh, a cover page, you know, cover image, which will be of a cricket match. It's often evoked in public discourse in that, uh, for that reason, uh, when debates about English national identity are played out. Yeah. And of course, in England, cricket is very much about uh, it evokes a bucolic image of a pristine England, uh, you know, unsullied by modernity. And uh, talking about cricket is a way of trying to recover a past that existed before the onset of modernity, which is why English cricket, of course, is suffused with a discourse of nostalgia yes. and, and evokes constantly this idea of a lost paradise. Uh, the present is always a fall from some, uh, you know, idyllic uh, past. And, 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 um, and this is a tradition that is very long standing. We tend to think today in the 21st century when people look at you know, uh, instant cricket and they complain about how it's perverted the, you know, the, uh, sort of the norms associated with the game and so on. Uh, and they complain about how the present is very, you know, it's fallen from the golden uh, sort of the heights of the past. But people were saying exactly the same thing in the 1850s. <laughs> you know? So there's a long standing tradition of writing and thinking and, 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 um, and, and uh, reflecting on English cricket in that way. Now, uh, scholars who look at Indian cricket often argue, or some uh, dominant in, uh, sort of uh, interpretations, most uh, specifically Ashish Nandi's uh, book on cricket, they argued that it was this bucolic ideal uh, of the rural game that was transplanted to the Indian context mm -hmm. and that it, uh, cricket becomes popular in South Asia largely because Indian elites uh, also take to the game and Indians take to the game because it resonates with the, um, the rhythms of an agrarian civilization. So crickets, uh, the fact that it was a rural pre-modern game um, resonated with an Indian society which was itself uh, you, you know, ambivalent about modernity and, and cricket represents that uh, mm -hmm. sort of, uh, synthesis of the, uh, of the British and the Indian. Now, my argument uh, against that is that it doesn't fit the empirical facts of the case, which is that cricket really begins in the cities. Cricket in India has never been about the rural, you know, mm -hmm. um, though, of course, the one exception to this is a filmic one, which is this uh, famous film Lagan, which fits an Indian, even Indian villagers playing cricket against a British uh, uh, sort of army team. But the fact is that cricket emerged in the cities, uh, most notably Bombay, but also in other places where uh, uh, British um, um, sort of soldiers or civilians were stationed, and of course was taken up by Indian educated middle classes. Um, and then of course, it also, it also has a demotic dimension, but that comes later. But the mm -hmm. point is that in the Indian context, cricket is always an urban game. And cricket, my argument is that cricket, to understand why cricket is popular in India, you have to understand its roots in uh, its, uh, uh, the, the way in which it's very much tied up with the emergence of modernity in India or the elaboration of modernity in India. Mm -hmm. uh, in, and from the mid 19th century onwards, cricket is played in towns and cities. It takes root in an institutional context of schools and colleges and so on. The British didn't really promote the game in an active way, but it was part of the, uh, you know, uh, people were introduced to it in school and college and so on. Uh, you, you also have then that density of institutional culture building up and, and uh, over time. And so in a sense, and of course, it becomes very integral, as I said, to the emergence of a public culture in uh, urban public culture and so on. So unlike Britain, cricket in India has always been an urban sport and its uh, importance lies in the fact that it's very much tied up to the story of India's modernity. I think South Asian modernity 
And I think this is an argument, I'm not the first to make this argument. Arjuna Padure famously made it in, an, uh, uh, in, a, in a very um, seminal essay that he wrote. On, uh, it was a very schematic essay, but it kind of makes an argument that it's really, cricket is very much tied up with South Asian modernity. So it's not so much a pre-modern game. Uh, it's, it's, cricket's very modernity uh, propels its popularity. So I wanted to turn to the question of, of race and racism, which of course on, on everybody's minds in this country, uh, as, as well as other parts of the world. And the earliest tours of, of English cricketers to India, as, as you describe very vividly, were very often marked by ugly racism. Um, at the same time, cricket itself becomes a sort of bond between the white settler colonies and the motherland. So it has a sort of race, racial dimension in that way. Um, at the same time, there were some, um, perhaps idealistically, who saw that, you know, perhaps on the cricket pitch, um, some of those distinctions of race might be, be leveled. Um, and I wonder if you could say how, uh, a bit more about how race plays into the early history of cricket in India. Yeah, that's a very, very fascinating question. I, I think race is very central to the way cricket um, evolves in colonial India. And again, it illustrates how cricket is a site in which one can look at the elaboration of colonial uh, cultures and especially the public culture. Uh, I mean, this is a, a context, especially in the late 19th, by the late 19th century, when the public sphere and the public uh, cultures of cities were very uh, deeply segmented. And, and, and race is often the key dividing line between the Europeans and the non-Europeans. Uh, of course, race also plays a part in mediating the relations between other communities, but we'll come to that. But, but the key uh, marker is, of course, within colonized civil societies, this, the racial divide was a very real one. On the other hand, cricket complicates the story because institutionally it's organized in a way that deepens the racial divide. But the discourse of cricket suggested that sport must be kept away from politics, that the sports field is somehow an arena in which um, you know, all that counts is sporting at ability, that, that everybody can be equal on this playing field as it were, which of course is blatantly not true as far as the, the politics of the sport was concerned. And what happens in the late 19th century is, as I said, the British were never strident promoters of the game. They were very, uh, uh, I, I point out the fact that they were very deeply ambivalent about uh, Indian state into the game, uh, most notably with the Parsis. On the one hand, they were amused and, and curious about the Parsis taking so enthusiastically to this game. But they were also in, incredibly um, uh, sort of rude and, and ungenerous and, and downright hostile uh, to the, you know, the Parsis when they start winning at the game of cricket. And the cricket field becomes a site in which those tensions are played you know, between the Parsis and the Europeans. Now, what's interesting about that story, just as an aside, is that we tend to think of the Parsis being very close collaborators of the British, but on the cricket field, that wasn't in evidence at all. The Parsis felt very deeply the way uh, the racial slides of uh, European um, competitors and so on. But race is very central because race is the way in which cricketing relations between Europeans and Indians um, are, are mediated. And the classic example of this, of course, is one that uh, Ram Gu has also talked about, and I also discuss in the book, which is the, the use of, you know, the, the fight between the polo players and the cricket players on the Bombay Maidan. It's a classic example of the Europeans trying to assert their um, sort of control over urban space, taking up the one open space available in Bombay for cricket and running their polo uh, ponies over it. And the cricketers using all the techniques of colonial petitioning and so on to fight the colonial regime, winning a temporary battle and then finding themselves constantly, you know, their gains being whittled away by the Europeans constantly reasserting their primary status in the city and so on. Um, so racial uh, tensions, racial conflict and the racial divide is very central to the organization of cricket. And at the same time, we have to bear in mind that there were, in a sense, the colonizers had the problem of their own discourse, which suggested that sport could allow for equality. So that tension between the discourse of equality and the practice of inequality is very central to the way in which the relationships between colonizers and colonized is mediated on the cricket pitch. Absolutely. And that leads to, in, you know, in some ways, the, the, the thing that makes the story so fascinating, even for readers who may not know much about cricket, is, is the the team itself and the yeah. fact that the team provides a window um, into both the, the diversity of communities in India, 
but also it's like a window into the social and communal tensions, uh, the process of elite formation, the role of the princely states. Uh, I wonder if you, you could introduce the team uh, to, to our viewers and listeners um, to say a little bit about perhaps some of the more sort of memorable uh, characters who, who, who ended up being on the first All India cricket team. Yes. Um, as you can imagine, this was the most uh, fascinating and enjoyable book, uh, bits of the book for me personally. Uh, but it was also the most challenging uh, mm. because in a way, um, I wanted to, uh, you, you, you know, if it was a conventional sports book, you would simply go on and describe each individual and say whether he was a batsman or bowler. But this was not, Cricket Country was not conceived as a cricket book in that sense. Um, and I might just say, add here that I th always thought of it as a book that would take uh, an event and think of it as any historian might think about a historical event, not a cricket event, but a historical event where the boundaries are very labile and protein and, and the material spills all over. I, because really, in a sense, I wanted to use this event to think about some larger questions of how one thinks, you know, the kind of questions that historians are interested in, the relationship between structure and event, the mm -hmm. relationship between narrative and analysis, you know, how does one kind of write about an event, but also at the same time tell a story uh, you know, which is not simply a straightforward one thing succeeding another kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And this posed pe uh, peculiar problems when it came to writing this part of the book. Um, I, I, I should also point out at this point that this, the book actually has a temporal framing to it. Yeah. As you noted at the outset, it starts with that, uh, you know, the description of cricket in Bombay. And it starts in mid-19th century Bombay. Mm -hmm. The event itself happens in 1911. So one of the things that I did with the book was to think, okay, if this is a historical event, what is its temporality? Where does the story begin? The research quickly showed me that actually, you know, I couldn't start in 1911. I had to, as I began doing the research, I realized there were these 12, uh, you know, these three failed attempts over 12 years to form an Indian cricket team. And, you know, the Parsis were a key component of this cricket team. So you had to kind of push the narrative back to the time when the Parsis began to take the game because they were the first ones to bring teams out to Britain in the 1880s. Mm -hmm. So all of that, you know, had to be factored in. So in a sense, the temporal framing of the book really reached back into the mid 19th century. And the way the book is organized is that I kind of used a Brodellian sort of scheme, except that Brodell goes vertically and I went horizontally, which is <laughs> sort of a temporal triptych. You know, you start with structure, you kind of paint the broad brush of the board of structure of cricket world. And that is, you know, on the one hand, Indians taking to the game, the question of race relations, etc. Mm -hmm. This and then moving on to conjuncture, which is the actual, uh, the context of the early 1900s when mm -hmm. cricket, uh, this idea of an Indian cricket team takes shape. And then finally ending with the event, which is the tour itself. Yeah. So this is the really the second part of the book, the question, you, which is how does this team come together? And it's really a story of the 1900s. Yeah. And the, the reason it was challenging was that I didn't want to simply write about these players individually. Of course, I was interested in them, but I knew mm -hmm. that this was not a cricket book. So I had to think about why this is important. And it quickly became um, apparent that the key, the key factor that, that kind of unites the stories of all these individuals is A, that the cricket, the cricket team is chosen on the lines of religious community. Yes. So community identity is very central. So you have mm -hmm. six Parsis, you have five Hindus, you have three Muslims, you have a Sikh captain. The Hindus have two, you know, amongst the Hindus are two Dalit players. That's never happened in the history of independent India, you know. Uh, yeah, two Dalits haven't played side by side in, in an Indian cricket team since 1911. So, so that, you know, so, so you had this extraordinary story of how a, the team is chosen on religious lines. It's chosen according to these communities, which tells you about the, you know, the, the, the colonial sociology that informs the making of this team, which is that the sport had to be organized along lines of community and that the team is composed along lines of religious identity because mm -hmm. that seemed to be the defining feature of Indian society. So, you know, um, so there was that. But it was also the case that as I began to do the research, I realized how in the 1900s, in the decade before this tour happens, cricket gets bound up with um, ideas of community and yes. uh, the cricket field becomes a site in which visions of uh, collective definitions of community are played out. Mm -hmm. So uh, the chapter that deals with the making of these uh, different uh, communities in the cricket team uh, goes into the different ways in which that happens. So with the Parsis, for example, um, 
The whole story of community and cricket is bound up with the Parsis' growing sense of their own racial, what they saw as their, uh, you know, so-called racial regeneration. You know, there's a whole uh, sort of worry in the Parsi press about their declining physical prowess. Uh, you know, the fact that their numbers were dwindling. Uh, you know, a lot of anxieties about racial decline, and and it was a small community, so you could see that those fears would be very, uh, you know, that they resonated as it were. Amongst the Muslims, on the other hand, the relationship between cricket and community takes a different form. It's about the relationship between uh, Islam and Western modernity. And, and Syed Ahmed Khan, who forms the Aligarh College, which is the, the uh, home, you know, the sort of the place from which a lot of the Muslim cricketers of this period come, and including the ones who play for this uh, mm -hmm. cricket team. Uh, Syed Ahmed Khan and, and the uh, Oxbridge uh, sort of teachers who he employed in that school uh, saw cricket as being key to fashioning, uh, you, you know, uh, Muslim political subjects who could be equally at home, you know, on the cricket pitch and discussing uh, sort of uh, Islam. So it's a kind of, uh, you know, sort of uh, Western education and Islamic learning. And, and uh, everybody who visited Aligarh College in the early 1900s talked about the fact that a huge central place was accorded to cricket in the college. Um, including, of course, its most famous uh, representatives who all went on to become famous uh, politicians, Sh the Ali brothers, for example. Shaukat Ali was a famous cricketer. You know, he had been the college uh, cricket captain of the college team. And then, of course, amongst the Hindus, the, the relationship between um, cricket and community takes a slightly different form, which is the question of caste. Mm -hmm. And you have the emergence of Palwan Karbalu and his brother, both of whom play for this cricket team. There might have been a third brother who might have also played for this team had this... Uh, principle of communal representation not intervened and, and you know so it could only be these two brothers uh, but that is a remarkable story too because here you had two Dalits playing cricket uh, playing for the Hindu uh, Gymkhana in, in Bombay uh, and then playing for this Indian cricket team uh, and that tells you about how cricket had become a site in which um, arguments about uh, the community's identity the question of you know what it is to be a Hindu uh, the notions of what a liberal Hinduism might look like. And, of course, this idea that, you know, uh, when it comes to the cricket pitch, you have to use all the resources. So if, if it means playing Dalits, so be it, you know. And, but then a, a great deal of self-congratulation over that fact, you know, rather, and, and sort of seeing this as somehow the product of Hindu upper caste benevolence, rather than seeing it as a case of, you know, these two stalwart, you know, Dalit players who are extraordinary players, who kind of forced their way and forced the Hindu community to take, to kind of take cognizance of their talent. So in a way, uh, the team became, uh, uh, you know, the, the putting together of this team became, uh, an op gave me an opportunity to explore this relationship between community and cricket. So even though the book is about the nation and cricket, in a way, the, the, the conception of the nation was along lines of community. So the standard relationship between nation, community and, um, and cricket uh, is what I explored in that um, uh, chapter. And then, of course, the subsequent chapter tells the story of this singular character who becomes the captain, who is, of yeah. course, uh, uh, Maharaja Bhupinder Singh. And this was a fascinating story. Now, this was a story that I had not expected to find. Because as you know, uh, the princely states record that the princely states can be a bit patchy. And mm -hmm. I thought I would not find anything very specific on his participation in this tour, you know. Uh, but as it happened, serendipitously, I found these files where Bupinder's ca you know, captaincy of this team and his desire to go to England were the subject of colonial official record keeping. Because it then turned out that this was a long standing story which had to do with the way Patiala, the Patiala state had been run. Bupinder's father was one of the early pro you know, promoters of princely promoters of cricket in, in North India, Rajinder Singh. He had died young. Bupinder had been a, a young prince when, when his father died. And he had, you know, the, the state had been governed by a council of regency and so on. The colonial state had established its own control over Patiala. And when Bupinder was given his ruling powers by Lord Minto, who had a long-standing family connection with him, um, there was a great deal of anxiety about how he would turn out. And as it happened, in the early months of his, after he'd been given his formal powers, you know, there were all kinds of rumors about, you know, his uh, sexual escapades, the fact that he had fallen into the wrong hands. And of course, this old Victorian idea that, you know, he was, you know, his character was constantly being questioned. You know, he was not of sound character. He was going the way of his father and so on. And then I discovered that Bupinta then uses this cricket tour to develop links with his, uh, you know, with the imperial establishment in London 
as a way of fighting his battles in Patiala against the local residents and so on. And, and there, there were official minutes about the protocols of his going to England as captain of this cricket team. And by the way, he didn't initially, he had turned down the captaincy of this team. It was not even clear that he would travel. But then he meets uh, Lord Hardinge, the new Viceroy, who congratulates him in Lahore when they meet in, you know, in, in February 1911. And, and Hardinge says, oh, I gather you're going as captain of the Indian cricket team. And when the then cables the Indian cricket selectors and says, I will go and I want to be the captain. So, so there was this amazing story that emerged out of the archive of, of his involvement in the story, which also then became a way of thinking about the place of sport in princely politics, because yes. that was not the first to use princely poli you know, cricket as a way of negotiating his way around the imperial, uh, you know, in the imperial um, sort of establishment. The most famous example I talk about in the book uh, uh, about this too is Ranjit Singhji, who yes. becomes the ruler of Navanagar. Uh, you know, and and those who are interested in that story should read Satatru Sen's brilliant uh, uh, you know book on Ranji. Uh, it's called Migrant Races, and and Ranji of course uses his cricketing superstardom to become the the ruler of Navanagar. You know, uh, so so the place of cricket uh, as this game, which you know English sort of the English establishment is, uses as a test to see how civilized you are and whether you're one of us or not. Um, Ranji uses it successfully and Bupinda tries to do the same thing. So these, uh, you know, so that's the story of these characters. And so when you think of it, I have this photograph of the team gathered together, you know, on the eve of their journey to London. And it's such an extraordinary group of men. You know, you have a Sikh captain, you have two Dalit uh, players who come from the opposite end of the social spectrum the social hierarchy, you have six Parsis, you have five Hindus, you have you know, three Muslims. And the second Dalit, by the way, would not have made the journey had uh, two of the players, Muslim players from Kashmir, they dropped out. And then uh, Balu's brother, Shivram, is told on the day before he has to journey that, that, uh, that he's going on this road. So he gets his papers and uh, clothes and uh, personal effects together very quickly. And of course, when on the eve of their departure, when there is a ceremony held to... Um, honor all the players. The two Dalit players are the only ones who are not given any garlands and so on. So it's, it's, a, it's an amazing story, you know, um, of how these guys come together. And, and that farewell reception is quite extraordinary because you have the great and good of India's high society gathered there. And among the most uh, fascinating figures present on that occasion, though he didn't speak, was of course Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the future. You know, so, 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 it, it, so I felt that you know, telling that story and putting it in that context was a way, it was almost like a history of modern India. And, you know, so I say it's really the idea of India, you know, coming into being on the cricket pitch, uh, but an idea which is inflected by colonial sociology, which is inflected by all these competing ideas of community mm -hmm. and nation. And so that's why it's both challenging to write, but also exciting once it starts falling into place. And, and I really do think that's one of the things the book does just, just brilliantly. Um, one of the things you capture really, really um, powerfully in the book is, of course, the political context, especially in the lead up to the tour in 1911, um, especially the rise of, of mass politics and the turn to a more radical anti-colonialism in India. Um, yeah. And in many ways, the first tour is, is a response to this, even a, a reaction against it. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. Yeah. So, I, I, as I was saying, that you know, the second part of the book is really a conjunctural history of what's yeah. going on in the 1900s. And one of the things I'm trying to do, there, there are two things actually. One is, I'm trying to argue, I mean, today, as you know, there's so much of a hype, you know, so much hyper nationalism around cricket. And the cricket team is seen as a natural, uh, organic expression of the Indian nation itself, somehow. You know? um, and, and what this hyper nationalism doesn't recognize is actually how tangled the relationship between empire and nation is as far as cricket is concerned. Yeah. So the first Indian cricket team is actually a collaborative exercise mm -hmm. fashioned by the empire and Indian elites, you know. Um, and, and also the second aspect of that is that this was not by no means inevitable that this would happen because there are these three failed attempts. Uh, you know, the first attempt is 1898 around the figure of Ranji who doesn't want to lead in an Indian cricket team because he wants to establish his credentials in Britain. And he, his place in England as an English, because Ranji played for England, you see. And so there was a big question mark in England over Ranji playing for England, uh, given that he was an Indian. And Ranji was very nervous about the fact that if he played for India, then somehow his status as an English cricketer would be called into question. So that attempt fails. In the early 1900s, I talk about other attempts that are made to put together this team. 
But the one that's relevant to the question you asked um, most immediately is the, uh, the uh, context that uh, happens from 1905 to 1909. This was famously the period when the first mass uh, political movement emerges in Bengal in the form of the Swadeshi movement and then is diffused to other parts of India. And when the Swadeshi movement fails, uh, or, or sort of towards uh, sort of the end of 1907, beginning 1908, you have a turn to a kind of, of what came to be known at that time as you know revolutionary terrorism. You know the idea of revolutionary violence against those uh, you know individual British officials and so on. Mm. Now this was the context in which um, more moderate uh, Anglophone Indians who, who wanted to emphasize India's uh, loyalty to the British Empire, India's place within the imperial uh, system, try to use cricket as a way of promoting goodwill and, and trying to, um, um, and also question the conservative right in Britain who are saying, well, if Indians are coming over to Europe, because most famously, um, you had the assassination of Curzon Wiley at the India office in, in uh, 1909. And the first, the first meeting to uh, organize this tour happens a couple of months after the assassination of Curzon Wiley. And one of the things that happens when Curzon Wiley is assassinated is that this, uh, the newspapers, conservative newspapers in Britain start questioning the unfettered right of Indians to come to Britain. They say if Indian students are going to come here and assassinate, he was, uh, uh, Curzon Wiley was assassinated by Madan Lal Dingra, who's a student mm -hmm. at University College London. And the argument was that if these, if these Indian students are coming over here, getting radicalized and killing uh, Britishers, then perhaps it's time to stop the movement of Indians into Britain. So there was a whole ramifications to this that had begun to become very apparent to those who were very worried, you know, those who regarded themselves as Anglophone moderates who wanted to be a firm India's place within the British Empire and so on. So the tour really becomes a way of using cricket to signal to the British establishment that, you know, that these acts that are carried out are not by no means represent the will of the majority. The majority wants to be part of the British Empire. And what better way to do it than uh, through cricket? And of course, the moving spirit behind this, uh, James Ramji Patel, who's also the first historian of Indian cricket, as it were, very famously says that, you know, it, on the cricket pitch, you know, uh, sport will heal the racial antagonism. It will become a way in which, the, you know, colonizers and colonized can be reconciled to each other. So the tour is basically... Uh, uh, you know, it's plugged into this larger context, it emerges out of this larger context in which uh, one might say those who regarded themselves as moderate uh, nationalists or those who wanted to, you know, who felt that they could reconcile their patriotism with belonging in empire. Now, this is a, a, a kind of a tradition that really dies out after 1918. So one of the things about this cricket tour is that it's symbolic significance really resides in the fact that it belongs to that moment, you know, when it's possible to reconcile nation and empire. Mm -hmm. That's that's a context that changes, as we know, after Gandhi and 1918. It becomes very, very especially after Daniel Malabar, when, you know, you can either be for nationalism or you can be for empire. That middle, you know, the sort of the empire loyalism, if one might call it. Though I think mm -hmm. there are problems with using empire loyalism because these people, mm -hmm. that suggests a kind of unquestioning acceptance. I think these are people who I would say try to reconcile notions of patriotism, but their conception of patriotism is different from those who come after them. I mean, so it's possible to be Indian and British, you know, that mm -hmm. combination. Um, and that is what I think this cricket tour for them, uh, you know, people like the Tatas or from Japan, they believe that actually India's good lies with the British Empire. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the, uh, Tata is a classic example. Uh, Ratan Tata, who's one of the uh, moving spirits behind the 19, uh, this 1911 cricket tour, all the meetings of the cricket selection committee are held in the Tata offices. You know, uh, Tata on the one hand is uh, sending money to Gandhi via Gokhale. On the other hand, he also affirms his, you know, his, his membership of the empire. He's part of the London metropolitan elite and so on. You know, he's traveling to London each year. So I wanted to capture that the texture of this moment, you know, which we forget. And this event actually, in a way, plugs in with my light, larger interests in this moment before 1918, you know, when this kind of politics was actually uh, the dominant form. I mean, I think in a sense, the Gandhian moment is a supplanting of that, you know.
I mean, that's something I think the book does does really sensitively. And my my own sense is that in in a way it's become harder than ever for us to understand the world of those who tried to reconcile, as you put it, their patriotism with membership in the empire. Because you know, it seems to me that in our current moment, you know, on the one hand, in the UK, you have uh, you know these unapologetic celebrations of empire that are published. On the other hand, within South Asian history, I think there's been, you know, a turn towards a sort of romance of radicalism and a, increasingly a sort of celebration of those, you know, not even the Gandhians, but those who really sort of uh, took up arms against the British Empire. And, and it seems to me that there's sort of maybe as little space as there ever was uh, to understand the complexities of the politics that, that, that you sort of sketch out. That's one of the things that makes the book uh, poignant. And I think, you know, loyalism may be the wrong term because it comes with the connotations of, of, uh, of, of collaboration or of, of, of somehow sort of uncritical uh, loyalty. Whereas I think what you bring out so, so nicely in the book is, is, is the sort of the shades of gray, the complexities yeah. of, of affiliation. Um, which brings me to uh, sort of the next move in the book, which is, you know, you start with Bombay, but the description of London as a city at the heart of empire, uh, also as an anti-colonial metropolis, uh, is, is just as compelling. And if you don't mind, I'd just like to read a very short um, passage, which is from uh, chapter seven, the city of the world. Um, but imperial intimations could also be discerned in the more prosaic features of London's built environment. Nowhere was this more so than the docks, wharves, and warehouses lining the Thames Riverfront from Tower Bridge to Tilbury, whose smudgy detail had once reminded Henry James of nothing less than the wealth and power of the British Empire at large. Within their capacious precincts were housed a staggering array of commodities that testified to the global reach of the imperial metropolis. And I think you, you sketch a sense of the, the atmosphere of London in, in 1911 so, so beautifully. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit about, you know, how, how did the players see London and, and how were they received there? Yes. So this is, this is the part of the book where, you know, keeps sticking to the temporal triptych as where I move from uh, the, the conjuncture, as it were, to the moment of the event itself. Uh, and so I had to kind of uh, think hard about how to write this. Um, Again, you know, if it had been a conventional cricket to a book, I would have skipped all of this because it would go straight into where, where they played first and so on. But this was for me the most interesting moment because I thought, okay, um, as you know, global history has, has uh, alerted us to the fact that the, the period we're talking about is one of the, uh, you know, sort of the age of imperial globalization and so on. And it occurred to me as I was thinking about this, that actually 1911, in a curious way, represents the apogee of this age of imperial globalization. And I think that's for many reasons. I think it's partly because this is the one moment three years before the 1914, when you could say that all, you know, this is a system that had flowered to the great age, you know, the, 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 situ uh, the system created by this world of, imperial contact and global reach and global networks had reached its fullest flowering in, 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 in within that structure as it were and it was a it was a world in which people were moving around goods were moving around um, uh, ideas were moving around and all of this was only possible because of course of the uh, fact that global history has sensitized us to these flows and connections and networks and so I approached this through the prism of global history but wanted to kind of focus it very much on this particular summer. Use that summer mm. to think, uh, you know, or that temporal moment to think about an entire world, of, you know, this density of history condensed in one summer. That was what I was trying to do with this, this part of the book. And, and of course, I had to then begin with London because you have to imagine this summer when the Indian cricket team arrives. Uh, what struck me when I was reading the newspapers of the time was I would start by looking for the Indian cricketers and so on, but my attention would always, and I did this, you know, before the digitization project of the British Library had really taken off. You know, it was one of those things where when I started doing it, I was doing the old microfilm way. And then, you know, by the end, it was all this stuff was coming online. But when I started doing it, I was so easily distracted by the front pages of the newspapers because they were all about the people arriving in London. And, and the more closely I looked at it, and it suddenly struck me that I had been thinking that the two big events of this year were the coronation, uh, you know, the uh, Darbar in Delhi and the move mm. of the capital from Calcutta to Delhi. But in London, it's a completely different scene. 
this is an extraordinary summer in which you have, you know, uh, the coronation of a king, which happens in London first. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the, um, an imperial conference, you have, ex you know, you have the festival of empire, you have coronation exhibitions, um, you have all these imperial premiers arriving, you know, and so it seemed to me that the entire world had converged on London, you know, so I wanted to capture the flavor of what it might be that these cricketers who are my central subjects are suddenly turning up in London and they're dwarfed by this fact that the whole world seems to be in London. And I thought I enjoyed this chapter very much because, writing this chapter very much, because of course, um, you will recall I have, I found a diary of two of the Indians who traveled, you know, one of the Indians who traveled kept a diary and then there was someone else also, a South Indian who also traveled to England that summer to the coronation and who wrote a book about it. So I had these two accounts of these two um, uh, people who traveled the same summer and come to London. And of course it became, you know, what I would have really liked is if one of my cricketers had kept a diary or something. <laughs> so I had to do the next best thing to see, okay, what would somebody arriving there have seen? And, and I found these two diaries. And then, you know, using that with all the newspaper material of that summer, it, you know, it, it gave me a sense of a, an entire world and, and, and this density of global contact that had been building up over 30, somehow being condensed in that you know, very short period of two to three months, you know. I mean, and don't forget, I, I should have mentioned the Universal Racist Congress. I mean, so you have, on the one hand, you have all these imperial pageantry and pomp, you have the imperial conference from which India is excluded. And then you have the, uh, the Universal Racist Congress, which is a quite a unique moment, you think. You know? So it seemed to me a perfect way of, you know, it's really the world, in, that's why I call it the city of the world. You know, it's that sense of everything converging in one place at one time, uh, and and so it's a density of history, but it's also the sort of time coming, sort of being condensed, you know. So uh, and and so I didn't act, I don't actually write, I, I kind of imagine what the Indian cricketers might have seen, yes. and so you know and and of course you know there are photographs of the cricketers that summer and so on. So it it, it became very clear that they were part of this larger moment in which people were coming and um, going as it were. The other thing is the Indian newspapers of this time. <laughs> also were full of the coronation development, people traveling to, you know, mm -hmm. lots of ordinary Indians were going to England at this mm -hmm. time. So, I mean, now when we think of a world where the borders are again coming up and, and, and you know, and Britain itself is mm -hmm. retreating from that global presence at a very rapid rate, yeah. you just think, you know, that was London in 1911. It would have been recognizable, I think, to people living in London in 2012. But yeah. perhaps not so in 2022. Who knows? You know? I mean, yeah. uh, That's no. a really interesting thought. As an ex-Londoner, I mean, I certainly recognized it, you know, from at least, you know, about 10 I mean, years ago. I don't know what Brexit is going to do, but you could imagine the world of diminished possibilities, you know, and that's what, mm -hmm. so, so it seemed to me that, you know, if I could write somehow, and, and that was the one chapter that, you know, I thought, people who are going to be looking at this cricket book are going to be looking at this chapter and saying, what's this guy doing? But I thought, you know, the, the, the aim for me was really to capture the texture of that moment, you know, which is that you then get down to the details of what's going on. And, and you find odd things. I mean, I talk about the fact that in, you know, the 19 January, 1911, the Evening Standard is running stories on foreign undesirables in yes. London, you know. Yes. So you think, you know, that dialectic of the openness and then the suspicion to openness about what openness might do, all of that was playing out at that time. So it became a way of capturing that world, you know, of, um, of, yeah. of these different contrary tendencies and, and, you know, simultaneously this mobility that exists within the empire but also the constant boundary making that excludes people from it. And of course, the Indian cricketers were not even the only Indian sports people to be in London that summer, as, as you point out in the following chapter. And would you say a little bit about some of the others? Yeah. Now, this again, you know, as I said, this book is quite a long one. Um, and, and, you know, I think there would be people who regard some chapters as extraneous. Some might regard the London chapter as extraneous. Um, I think there might be, uh, there were some who complained that this chapter, you know, why, why is he going off from cricket to, to wrestling? In fact, I had one review saying, well, this book is fine, except for that chapter, which goes off into wrestlers and uh, squash, you know, rackets players and so on. But again, this was the, you know, so in a way, the, the, the logic here was, I had imagined uh, these Indian cricketers being these sort of standard bearers of some kind of Indian nationalist sporting, you know, um, uh, skill and, and coming to England and presenting themselves as symbols of India's nationhood and all of that, right? Um, but it turns out India was full, I mean, England was full of Indians that summer, you know, there were Indians attending all these different events. And then I thought to make that is even more complicated, these guys were not even the only Indian sportsmen there. There was this guy, uh, uh, you know, Jamshedji Marker, who's uh, 
the world champion in his sport. Now, rackets is the forerunner of squash. Yeah. And as you know, sub subcontinent actually has a long tradition of good, you know, accomplished squash players. Now, uh, rackets is the forerunner to this. And um, in, it had become a very popular sport in colonial India. It was played across in military stations. And that's where um, Indians who are part of the imperial, you know, in the um, sort of cantonments and so on, get exposed to it mm. and then pick it up and become very good at it. And Jamshedji Marker, I discovered, was coming to England in the summer of 1911. He came before the Indians. He was an accomplished cricketer, but a far more accomplished uh, um, sort of rackets player. What I didn't know was that he was the world champion in the sport and he was coming to defend it after eight years. So I started then saying, okay, how does this happen? You know, what does this guy, because I came across, the way I came across him was there was a story in the Daily Mirror, a uh, newspaper, tabloid newspaper at the time, where he's talking about the Indian cricketers. And I said, who's this guy? And I started reading about him and, and I, I had no idea that this chap was dead, you know, defending his world title and that he uh, actually won it uh, eight years before in, in 1903. So then I started digging into that story. And again, a very interesting story of uh, an Indian sportsman getting, uh, you know, taking up a colonial game, becoming adept at it, then coming across and, and being described in ways which are very similar to the way Ranji was described by the British press, you know, the Oriental magician and so on. So, and he happened to be very good friends with these Parsi cricketers. Mm. So that story I had to then tell, you know, uh, that then now Jamshedji was a very decorous figure. Okay, he's, um, and, and uh, just to sort of backtrack a minute, these Indian sportsmen are part of a much wider set of global sportsmen who are arriving in England that same summer. So there's a festival of empire sports uh, tournament that's organized uh, and India was excluded on, um, sort of for racial reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jack Johnson, the world's most famous boxer, arrived at the same time and he dominated the front pages uh, of the newspapers. So these Indians were not, you know, they were, uh, Indian cricketers were not the only sportsmen, there were these other Indian sportsmen, but all these sportsmen didn't get the sort of the, the press coverage that, that Johnson got. But, uh, now Jamshedji was very decorous, unlike Johnson, he kept to himself, didn't give any incendiary interviews and so on. Uh, but, uh, there was a whole bunch of other sportsmen, these Punjabi wrestlers, who had turned up for the second time in a row in London. And they were now sort of issuing challenges to European uh, wrestlers and, and, and defeating them. And all these Europeans who were, you know, wrestling in London, was, a lot of it was based on match fixing. You know, confronted with these earnest Punjabi sportsmen who claimed only to fight for glory and not for money, it was very off-putting for these Europeans, you know, who said, we can't fix matches with these guys and, and you know, it's a, you end up getting thrashed. So they weren't fighting them. And one of the most famous, of course, had come the previous year, Gama. Mm -hmm. The Gama's compatriots come uh, back in 1911 and, and the Indian cricketers go to watch them. So, so, so you had this very funny thing where the, you know, the Parsi uh, rackets player is friends with the Parsi cricketers. The, the Maharaja is leading his cricket team to watch these wrestlers. And of course, that gave me then a chance to think about cricket's own hegemonic place in relation to Indian sport, you know, I mean, sure. at the start of the 20th century, it became very clear there were lots of contending sports which could have had different, more prominent careers. Uh, and, you know, we don't think about it now because these histories are lost. I mean, who knows about these Punjabi wrestlers or, mm -hmm. or, or Jam Jamshedji Marker, completely forgotten, you know, mm -hmm. like Anji. And then, of course, you also had this other character, uh, Professor Ram Murti Naidu, who is this, who claims he's, uh, you know, sort of the Indian Hercules and he's performed all these uh, you know, amazing feats, physical feats. Now, he's not a sportsman in the conventional sense. He's not up to sporting glory, but he's he's interested in physical culture more generally. And, and is taken up by Hindu nationalists as a symbol of a national virility and so on. And an alternative conception of physical culture, which is not games-based. It's about mm. physical strength. It's about, you know, and also married to a certain tradition of showmanship and so on. You know, he comes out of that tradition of circuses, traveling circuses and so on. So what actually happens then in that chapter is that I try and show how, uh, and then of course, 1911 is also the sum, uh, summer when the Mohan Pagan football team defeats that European uh, Yorkshire regiment and, and wins the um, uh, football shield in Calcutta. So this is a summer in which all these different kinds of sporting activities were happening, most of them in London. And it gave me a chance to kind of uh, sort of put cricket itself in some perspective vis-a-vis -vis other sports, because in a way, I think, you know, the tendency to focus on cricket has often meant that we do it to the exclusion of other uh, activities, sporting activities and so on. And it's clear that at the start of the 20th century, there were many contenders for sporting prominence in India. And 
it, it raises an interesting question about why it is that cricket has completely, it's only now that some of these sports are beginning to come back in, mm. in, you know, in public consciousness. But at the start of the 20th century, all these sports had popular followings. You know, I mean, there's a very uh, astonishing photograph that I didn't use in the book because it was too grainy, but it was in this uh, British journal that I've used a lot in uh, my research called Health and Strength, mm -hmm. in which there's a photograph, very grainy of Gama in standing in the center of uh, Amritsar um, or Lahore maybe, and thousands of people are out with coming to see him off for his trip to London. Right. And I thought, you know, I mean, this is quite extraordinary that these are people, and, and Ram Muthi uh, attracted thousands of people wherever he went to watch his uh, shows and so on. So there's an alternative tradition of physical culture that is, uh, Ram Muthi Naidu very clearly claimed that he was trying to invent a form of uh, physical culture that would reject the Western notions of strength, try to use spiritual power, for example. Mm. So, so that chapter is essentially a way of showing how you have this uh, Jamshedji, who's this very quiet, unassuming Parsi, who plays a colonial sport, but which he is a kind of, uh, you, you know, uh, acquired uh, complete mastery in, uh, to the extent of becoming world champion. At the other end, you have something like Ramoti Naidu. All these forms of physical culture, which kind of are the ecosystem in which cricket has to compete, you know, for public attention. Mm -hmm. And so finally, to, to the tour itself. Um, it, it didn't go exactly according to plan. No, no. no. And, and as one reviewer complained, you know, you wait for 272 pages for the tour to arrive. And I kind of thought he kind of missed the point, which is that it's not really one of those sort of uh, Arabian night style things, you know, where you don't, you defer the telling of the story as far as Indeed. Possible. So, but in the end, I had to get to the tour. And, and of course, what was very fascinating was that um, the hook, you know, the point of entry for me here was that this tour was not a conventional international tour in the sense that the Indians didn't come and play test matches. You know, I mean, these days, an the Indian cricket team would come, they would not play any local matches. They would, you know, they play a couple of practice games and then they'd go into these showpiece, set piece encounters, you know, these test matches, which are international, uh, comp you know, sort of con contests between uh, an Indian cricket team uh, representing India and, and England. Whereas with this cricket team, they didn't actually play an English national cricket team. Mm. What they did was basically went around England playing county sides. Um, and, um, and of course, they are incorporated into the rhythms of a traditional English summer where they appear as a brown team uh, who are, an, you know, kind of appended to the county championship. They don't get any points for any of the matches. So that's why the spectator interest tends to be less in their games. Mm. But they go around the country and you know, they travel all over the place. They go to England, they go to Wales, they play in Scotland, they go to Ireland. So I thought, okay, let me follow them around. And what does that tell me about the place of cricket in English national culture itself? Because, of course, the larger point here is that, um, the background point here is that this period is regarded as the golden age of English cricket. This is the period that everybody, you know, all the myth makers go back to pre-90 because it represents a pre-lapse area in pre-1914 world you know, whose loss is forever being lamented. Mm. And when I looked at it, the, the reality as historians know is golden ages are always retrospective things, you know. It, it was a period when people were complaining about how the game was going to the dogs. Uh, <laughs> English, English cricket was confronted. It was not, it didn't seem like a golden age to most people living there at the time. Yeah. And, and the reason for that was that English cricket itself um, was caught in a dilemma between its ideology, which claimed that it had to be a representative of a, an English bucolic, uh, an amateur tradition where you played the sport for sport's sake, you didn't think about commercialism, you didn't think about all the trappings of sport, you know, modernity in sport, you know, spectators, uh, profits, all of this cricket could have nothing to do with. But obviously clubs had to run and they couldn't do it on the basis, you can't waft sort of anti-institutional structures on the basis of nostalgia or whatever. So there was this tension between that ideological conception and the practical realities of managing a modern spectator sport. Mm -hmm. So I set the, the tour uh, itself within this larger context in which the Indian cricketers become part of the so-called the most golden of golden English summers. Because, you know, because I had thought when initially when I started the research, that, you know, my mental images of these Indians playing in these places where it was really cold and, you know, they would be really struggling. It turns out to be the seventh hottest English summer since the 17th century. Right. When the Indians suffer from the climate, it's because of the heat, not because of the, you know, the cold. And so I then, and, and also it was a summer when England was going up in flames. I mean, if we think now is, we are living in tumultuous times. I mean, you should see 1911, you know, 
working class unrest on the streets, you know, the, 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 the general strikes going on, you know, so ports are sort of being uh, blockaded. There's a fear, real fear, you know, uh, that there's some kind of revolution in the air. And, and, uh, and, and, and these cricketers are traveling the country, you, 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 you know, um, I guess this backdrop. And of course, you see how the cricket tour from the imperial perspective was a pedagogical exercise. It was an exercise in learning. So what the, cricket, uh, the English cricketing establishment, the imperial cricket establishment did was to pick the Indians against the strongest county teams, not for logistical reasons, but because it had to be a learning process, you see. So you, they, unless they play the strongest team, what's the point? You know, they're there to learn. And so I show how that then leads to these Indians being pitted against the strongest teams. They're not given in, you know, they, they play two matches a week, which is you play for three days, you have a day's rest, and then you start on the game. The Indians mm -hmm. have never played at this pace before, and, and they struggle. And then, of course, they lose, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Before uh, they start, uh, you know, mid, somewhere in the middle of the tour, they start reviving. And, of course, one of the reasons they lose also is that their leadership is in shambles. The, you know, Maharaja Patiala disappears. <laughs> You know, three matches into the tour, he's gone off because he's come to do politics. He's not really interested in, you know, the cricket. And, and he loses interest. And he takes the team's best batsman with him. So the Indians are really struggling. And then, of course, dissensions break out between the Hindus and Parsis, you know, over team selection and so on. But, the, but, but the, the, there is a, a turnaround midway through the tour. The Indians start winning matches. And, and of course, the reason for that is Palman Balu and the Dalit cricketers, you know. So, so that was for me the best, uh, you know, in terms of this, the satisfaction one gets out of, you know, the underdog triumphing. As it was. I mean, Balu and his brother turn yeah. out to be the real heroes at this okay. tour. You know, they're, they're constantly bailing out the Indian cricket team. They're constantly, you know, um, I mean, Balu injures his uh, shoulder severely by the time they get to Scotland because he's just shouldering so much of the bowling attack and so on. And so, um, you know, so, so the tour itself and its fate gets uh, sort of uh, caught up with this larger, you know, uh, the politics of that summer, but also the politics of English cricket. So that's what I, I, I try to set that story within these other stories, as it were. Yeah, and I think you do that brilliantly. And Prashant, I think uh, just in this conversation, you've given you've given everyone a sense of the uh, profound richness of this book, which I just enjoyed uh, absolutely and thoroughly. And thank you so much for this conversation. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, as I said, it's it's one of those books where, you know, when I was writing it, I just thought like, you know, it, it just never seemed to end. You know, I mean, I, you know, we we've often run into each other at the British Library where you know. You know we asked me what I was working on. I rolled my eyes and said that cricket book, you know. Um, so it's it's great that it, uh, you know, that it, that it got done in the end. But but I have to say, I mean, you know, for me, um, it's I see it less as a sports book, more as a book which takes an event and then tries to think about how do we write a history of an event. And you know, and 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 you realize that actually uh, uh, th there is so much to explore, uh, you know, once one starts examining more closely. And for me, the great joy was to actually capture some of the texture of that period, because that period is very much my period. I mean, my earlier work has also been mm -hmm. really about you know, late 19th, early 20th century. Mm -hmm. And it, and and those of us who have worked with those archives know there is a particular texture to the worlds we discover, you know, and, and the challenge is always translate that onto the page and somehow give the reader a flavor of what it might have been like, you know. So it's a kind of exercise in some sort of time travel at one level, you know. So, and, and that's what, one of the things I think it does so, so brilliantly. Um, Rashan, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sunil. Thank you. Um,